Hello, everyone. This is Bill Apter, and you're listening to The Sala Monster Sounds Off, and I'll see you at the matches. Welcome to a special episode of the Sala Monster Sounds Off, which you can listen to every Sunday on the Salamonster.com and other platforms. Jason back here with you. I have with me now another special guest. Uh, we've had a few of them recently, but none who can claim as many years in the wrestling business as this man. Over 45 years, I call him the godfather of Pro Wrestling Illustrated. Today he calls OneWrestling.com his home, and his book, Is Wrestling Fixed? I Didn't Know It Was Broken, is now available in audiobook form on Audible.com as of today. Bill Apter joins me. Bill, welcome. Well, first of all, you call me the Godfather. I don't know. <laughs> no, thank you. I, I really uh, appreciate that. And I've really been looking uh, forward to this. I've been listening to your show. And I've never been with the Sala Monster before. So, uh, yeah, it's great. And by the way, you said 45 years plus. Started in January 1970. Wow. But I was, but I was a fan since uh, I was about eight or nine years old. So, yeah, I got a lot of... Uh, pro wrestling history and sports entertainment in my mind and my body and i s still on like a college diet i only eat junk food so uh <laughs> uh i'm really 19 years old i know you recently attended the mid-atlantic legends fan fest in charlotte uh, mid-atlantic being one of the more prolific of all the territories back in the day how was the convention it was fabulous i i don't know how greg price does these things every year but uh, people who know my history know that for many years uh, I traveled regularly to the uh, Jim Crockett promotions area. And that like became that in Georgia and Florida became like my home territories for such a long time. So it was so wonderful going back after uh, quite a while of being away from there and seeing so many of the friends who came over to me and, uh, and, so, and reuniting with um, Magnum TA and Nikita Koloff, which means I have to say Magnum TA, <laughs> uh, 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 Paul Ellering, uh, Tully Blanchard. And it, it was just wonderful. And, you know, I used to have a, a, a weekly segment on Sundays for years on the Best of World Championship Wrestling. And uh, a lot of people got to know my face through that. So, uh, yeah, I just want to thank everybody in that mid-Atlantic area. But, man, the energy and the talent that were uh, brought in by uh, Greg Price. And I was booked there by uh, Charlie Armstrong from Gimmick Tree Entertainment. And T-Mart Promotions had so many of the mid-Atlantic guys. I mean, I, I saw Bob Cottle, Tony Schiavone, and Jim Ross together. They haven't been together in probably 20 years. Oh, yeah. Well, I was going to say, you know, I saw Tony did some videos, I guess, for some radio station. He did some uh, quick YouTube interviews, and he did one with Nikita Koloff, and Nikita looks great. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Nikita looks uh, – you know, Nikita actually looks better now than he did when he was in his prime wrestling. And he's such a great – human being. He's, uh, within the past two weeks, Craig Peters, who was one of uh, the uh, main editors of the Pro Wrestling Illustrated family, lost his wife at 57 years old. And uh, Nikita hadn't seen Craig in 15, 20 years. Uh, as soon as I let him know, he asked for Craig's number and he called him right away. He's one of the, one of the nicest persons I've ever met inside or outside the business. Yeah, no, but I, I saw you mentioned the video of uh, Tony and JR and Bob Cottle. I mean, they had all the different legends there. It looked like a, a fun time if oh, you were it was a great. It was great. And I've got, if you go to uh, One Wrestling Video, that's the number one, not the, the word. Go to OneWrestlingVideo.com. You can see my uh, short interview with Bob Cottle. And there are some more great interviews coming up from that uh, wonderful weekend. Uh, and they're going to do it again in August 2017. So I urge fans to go to nwalegends.com and uh, make sure you get uh, tickets way in advance. It was fabulous. And so many people came over to me either buying my book or they had the book already. And uh, I got goosebumps just uh, hearing what I meant to so many people. And I just, you know, I, I don't realize that. Well, I mean, when, when you think of pro wrestling journalists, I mean, Bill Apter is the first name that I think a lot of longtime fans probably think of, the Apter Mags, as they came to be called. Talk do, you about know, do, you, do you know, by the way, who came up with that? 
with the, the after Max? Yeah. No, I don't. It was Dave Meltzer. Ah, really? And I, and I used to call Dave and I said, Dave, please don't do that. He says, well, you're the face of the magazines. I said, yeah, but we, we're a whole staff of like 15 people <laughs> that put out that magazine. But Dave said, uh, you are the guy who's on TV. You're the guy who everybody sees. You're Jimmy Olsen. So they're the after mags. Well, you know, it's true because in, in the book, you even tell some stories of, of wrestlers who would be, you know, hot over the fact that they were, they had a bad spot on the, the PWI 500 or something, and they would blame you even though you had nothing to do with it. Absolutely. I was in that room when that, but first of all, as I said in the book, uh, I never was the originator of the PWI 500. I never ranked them. I never wrote all the copy. We would all go into a room uh, all the editorial people, along with one or two uh, people from the outside in the wrestling business, whose names I swore I would never reveal, and uh, just to temper us a bit, and uh, we'd rank like the first hundred guys, and then whoever was going to do the 500, which is Bob Smith did it most of the time, uh, Brandy did it once in a while, um, and some of the other editors, but that person, like Bob Smith, was one of the nicest people I ever met. But after that first hundred, when he was working on that for a few weeks, uh, he was like uh, he, he was like a uh, uh, an axe murderer. You couldn't go near him. <laughs> Good morning, Bob. Show what do you mean? You know, it's like yeah, it was very very difficult. And then, of course, going to the uh, uh, going to the shows, and not only the PWF 500, but the top ten rankings. They everybody was. Very. What do you mean? Uh, so and so is number three, and I'm number four. How did how did you come to that, Bill? And I did do the top ten ratings, and I would explain why. And it didn't matter. They'd be angry at me till the next show. How did the affiliation come about with uh, Pro Wrestling Illustrated back in the seventies? Well, they didn't start till 1979. Was Pro Wrestling Illustrated? I started in 1970 working for Stanley Weston at GC London Publishing and at that point he was uh, producing The Wrestler, Inside Wrestling and several other wrestling titles, a whole bunch of boxing magazines and an Old West magazine as well. And uh, one time he was going to do a, a magazine about the, the Bible, about God and uh, one of the other editors said, how are we going to get pictures? And he said, send after. <laughs> uh, the editorial staff was sitting around trying to come up with a name for a new magazine. Uh, Stanley Weston back in the 60s did Wrestling Illustrated, and someone suggested Pro Wrestling Illustrated. There's a, uh, uh, there's a, a discussion and a conflict whether it was Stu Sachs or Peter King back then. So uh, it wasn't me. Well, I mean, so while you were working for Mr. Weston, I know you became good friends with George Napolitano, uh, yeah. who I consider a friend. I mean, you and I have talked about that, and I've had him on the show before. I put this question to George, and I'll, I'll ask you also. Well, uh, before you ask me the question, sure. can I tell you how George and I first met? I'd love to know. I was shooting photos at Sunnyside Garden in Queens, and I ran out of film, which slapped me in the face for. So I turned around, and there was this guy with this pretty girl who looked like Cher, in the front row shooting pictures and I asked if I could uh, um, borrow a roll of film from him and he gave me some film and all that and we got to talking and uh, he asked me if I knew people you know to get him in as well and uh, I, I told him I just started with Stanley Weston but I heard that Ring Wrestling magazine uh, was looking for somebody and I think that's when he um, took the initiative and got started that way if I remember the story correctly huh. yeah I'm not sure if he remembers that. I hope he does. He might not. I'm older than him. I remember. Uh, you're on. only as old as you feel. Yeah. But what I was going to say is uh, Steve Carino once referred to you guys as the unsung heroes of before internet pro wrestling. That was his quote. My question to you is this. How pivotal a role did your work play in the careers of... Uh, of the wrestlers back then, because I think it's it's hard for newer fans to understand how influential those photos and the magazines were at that time. Um, one of the things that bugs me, and this is regarding your question, is that when anyone gets up in front of any company and is inducted into the Hall of Fame, the legends, they thank everyone from the president of the company down to the janitor. 
but no one ever says, other than Jerry Lawler and Mil Mascaris, uh, no one ever said, I want to thank the wrestling magazines for keeping me in the magazines before there was any internet. People didn't know who we were if we were on a, uh, let's say, a Texas TV show. They never would have been seen anywhere else in the world except for the wrestling magazines. So we were the internet before the internet. A classic story is uh, Paul Jones, when he came to wrestle at Madison Square Garden in, uh, for like one or two shows in the early 70s, came over to me in the dressing room and he said, you know what, you ran so many stories about me being in uh, the Carolinas that people came over to me outside the, uh, the entrance of the garden and knew who I was because of the magazines. We were the first people to really kick, kick off the Road Warriors. Even though they were on Ted Turner's network, we were putting them on the cover every month. Dusty Rhodes, same thing. Bruno San Martino. You know, Bruno didn't travel really out of the WWWF area except for one or two appearances in St. Louis and maybe out in California and some other places. Uh, other than reading the magazines, how would you have known about him? So yeah, the magazines were extremely, to use your word, pivotal in helping the careers um, of these wrestlers. And I find it, and I'm not looking to be named for this, and I don't think George would either, but it would be nice if some of these wrestlers who get up and accept these Legends Awards for their whole career say that it couldn't have happened without the magazines. What, what did you think when WWE moved all the ringside photographers off camera to more of a, a pit type area? I mean, as a fan, I kind of miss having the photographers ringside. It, it, to me, it makes the shows feel a little more important in a way, if that makes sense. Well, I think that uh, as soon as they went to high definition, unless they were going to sit there and put each photographer in the, in the uh, uh, makeup department, uh, that wasn't going to uh, happen. And I think it also became a situation where the television people considered it more of a, uh, a visual hazard than an enhancement. Remember, we're from the old school, and it always looks like, oh, isn't this great, like a big fight where all the photographers are on the ring. But I think that uh, WWE and TNA also has no ringside photographers except their house guy, Lee South, uh, it's just, uh, it's production value to make sure that you can control everything that goes on there. I remember many times shooting at the garden, you know, uh, one of the directors would send a message down, can you tell Bill to stay down? You know, that type of thing. So yeah, it was probably something they would have wanted to do ages ago, but they couldn't because the, uh, uh, the product was getting all that great coverage in the uh, magazines. Uh, it actually makes sense also because I think... Probably at that point, like you said, you get to a point where they're so big and things change so much that maybe in their mind, well... Well, wait, wait, wait. There is one thing There is one thing to cut in here that, that really bothered me. On several occasions in the WWE years ago, and I forgot who it was, it might have been with The Miz, possibly, where they had fake photographers taking pictures as they, he was coming down. Yes. The, uh, yes, it was. Yeah, and that was like, why didn't they call me? Why didn't they call George? <laughs> You know, and, and they, they were, you could tell they were models. Everybody everybody knew it, but uh, that, that was kind of like, really? Your book, I, I, was, I was fascinated reading about, you know, in the heyday of the magazines, you, you had, you, like, for example, using you as an example, you had your sources in every territory, and you'd get on Absolutely. the phone with Ole Anderson and Gordon Soley and Gary Hart and Stu Hart, and everyone had their own unique personality, yeah, some were more forthcoming with information than others. Talk, talk about what that process was like. Well, that was uh, once we started doing pre PWI weekly, uh, it became a little more intense because I needed to call these people even more than once a week. But that process was a lot of fun because every Monday morning I would come in, have my, uh, my diet soda and bagel and sit down. And depending upon geographically where the uh, – office was. I didn't want to call people too early. I usually started about 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. And uh, but usually when I got in during the prime days of Jim Crockett promotions, either I called him almost every day or he called me. We, we, we really had a, a beside business relationship. We had a really good friendship. 
Uh, and he knew the value of the publicity and he made sure everybody cooperated with us. Um, so I would call his office, then I would usually call Vern Gagne's office, uh, Stu Hart's office, you know, being three, four hours away geographically uh, in terms of time zones. Uh, I would call maybe once a week or once every other week. Uh, the Florida office was a, a regular call. And sometimes uh, there were a lot of guys in the offices that clammed up, didn't want, like Vern Gagne, who didn't want to give me information. And they put me on with uh, someone like his son who would say, well, you know, I'll tell you what's going on, but, you know, you can't tell anyone. And I developed trust with these people because I never double talked to people. I never, you know, if Greg Gagne told me something, I wouldn't go back and tell that to Gordon Soley or, or someone in the floor or Eddie Graham. And they respected that. Right. But it was fun. It was fun because it was a, it was my my contacts, and I and after that I would start calling the photographers and saying I think something might happen in uh, Tampa next week. I need to assign you to that. Make sure you're there. Um, yeah. So it, it was great uh, dealing with uh, all the promotional people. The only one that never got it was Don Owen up in Portland, Oregon. I'd say Don, Bill Abner, who? <laughs> <laughs> Every week. Let me put you on with my son. And then his son Barry would get on. So I miss those days. I miss uh, making those phone calls because it was like my own coffee clutch. Even though I don't drink coffee, it was my own diet soda clutch. Well, again, even just reading about it, it, it made me miss it in kind of a weird way because, you know, I mean, the business it's not is. Weird. It's just, I guess it's different now, obviously, than it was back then. I mean, you have different promotions, but. It's not the same as it was in the territory days. No, absolutely not. I mean, you know, even though with uh, OneWrestling.com and I get news and all that, everything's emailed to me. I don't even have to pick up a phone unless I say, can I, you know, come to your show and uh, 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 sign my books. That That's about it. Otherwise, hey, Bill, it's, the door's always open to you, which is terrific. And, you know, it's funny because one of the things that I did not cover in the book was the multi-year ban by the WWE of the magazines uh, because they had their own magazine, and uh, and now it's amazing that, you know, it, and they never put out a don't talk to Bill type of thing. I kept up my friendships with everybody in that office, including the higher ups, etc. Uh, they never did anything with me personally, but now on the other end of it, I'm on their network. Uh, I'm on a lot of their DVDs, and I'm going to be hosting the first WWE live event in my life in my life on December 17th at the Sands Casino in Bethlehem, PA. They're going to do a, uh, uh, an event with Ric Flair and Ricky Steamboat, and I will be hosting and moderating it. Oh, wow. Yeah, so this will be my first live WWE event. I've hosted conventions my whole life. Uh, I've done live shows my whole life, but I've never done an official one for the WWE. So I am so psyched. And hopefully uh, people who are listening to this in the New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, uh, Washington, Baltimore area, Maryland area will uh, will come to see that. Just go to the uh, Sands Casino in Bethlehem, uh, Pennsylvania website, and you can buy tickets there. That's and Wonderful cool. Willie will be there hosting, if you will. <laughs> well, that's very cool. And I was going to actually ask you about uh, some of the stuff you've done recently uh, for WWE. I mean, you've also written stuff for WWE.com. I, I know... Doing stuff for them was always something you wanted to do. What has that experience been like so far? Uh, it's still, and I use the word goosebumps for something else on this interview, but still goosebumps because here I am uh, at my age, uh, something I've always wanted to do when I was younger. I wanted to be the, uh, the backstage interviewer guy. Uh, always wanted to do that and it never happened. So when YouTube came out, I started doing that on YouTube. I was one of the first people to do video interviews online uh, on onewrestling.com and then over to a YouTube channel. So I got that, not out of my system, but I got to do that. But I always wanted to do that for WWE. So little by little, um, Triple H, who is an old school person in a new school world and knows how to meld them together perfectly because you can see the variety of things he's doing for the fans of WWE and including the fans who felt they were left out uh, because they only went to the Indies. So now he creates NXT and now the cruiserweight thing. He knows what 
wrestling fans really want. They're trying to make a little dent in in all of that to give everybody everything. So no, it, it's a thrill to be considered, you know, to get a call from uh, someone in their office, hey, Bill, we would love you to host this event. It's like, wow, I wish this, this was 25, 30 years ago, but I'm not going to say no now. Of course not. <laughs> I'm still, you know, people ask me, when am I going to grow up and retire? Never. I love what I do. Now, you were ringside for one of the most famous matches in the history of wrestling. In fact, you were uh, tipped off to the finish even before it happened. I'm talking about the night Bruno San Martino lost the WWWF title to Ivan Koloff. What was that night like? And is it true that you could hear a pin drop in that building when the referee counted the fall? Well, part two, yes. You could, 21,000 people were speechless. You didn't hear, you know, this day, in today's day and age, it would be holy SH, holy SH, but it was like a funeral. You know, there was, it was just, Everything, it was like it, everything just stood, time stood still. It was shocking. Nobody could believe that Bruno's reign came from an end. And although I was tipped off that it was going to happen that night, I was never told to finish. So I was like every other fan in a lot of ways where um, I had to wait and see what happened. It was a shocking night. And Bruno, I have audio interviews from all... The, all, all my interviews back then that I used for the magazines from the 70s and the, and the 80s on audio cassette. And a lot of them have been on OneWrestling.com. And, uh, you know, that night I went backstage and Lou Albano uh, uh, did a post set with me and Ivan Koloff. And I had a $49 Minolta cheap camera with me. Everything was grainy and Captain... Uh, uh, Captain always uh, was yelling out, let me tell you something, Bill Lapp, Ivan Koloff, I told you he'd beat him. And Bruno was so respectful. He says, what What can I tell everybody? You know, that, you know, I've beaten, this night Koloff was better than me. And that's, uh, you know, very classy. He's probably the classiest individual I ever met in the business. Yeah, I've, I've heard interviews with him. And even today, I mean, just the, the stories he shares and everything, he's still... You very, know what he can't do, very though? Very respectful, very respectful. You know what he can't do? He can't pronounce Vince McMahon's name. He doesn't say McMahon. He'll go, you know, that McMahon guy, McMahon. <laughs> he always say, you know, this McMahon guy, you know, he's got all the young guys. And then McMahon said to me... Well, I know. used to laugh all the time when uh, Jerry Briscoe was one of the Stooges on TV. And he would always, uh, he would go fetch coffee for Vince. And he would be like, Mr. McMahon, can I get that's you some right. coffee? <laughs> well, that's his, his Oklahoman... Uh, accent, but I used to also love when Bruno would say, and I always joke with him about this. Uh, the broadcaster would, uh, Vince would say, uh, "Bruno, uh, I understand you hate Bobby Duncan," and Bruno would say, "You know something, Vince? I don't hate Bobby Duncan. I just hold a lot of animosity toward him." <laughs> I used to love that. Oh, hate's, a, hate's a very strong word. It is. Um, it is. I want to ask you about. Jerry Lawler and Andy Kaufman, they had one of the most memorable feuds in wrestling. Uh, it helped make Lawler a national name. And people may not realize what got the ball rolling on the whole deal was a late night phone call from you to Lawler. How did that come about? Well, Andy Kaufman used to come to the, uh, and this is in my book, by the way, and in the audio version as well. Andy Kaufman used to come to the garden, Madison Square Garden, and he wanted to wrestle. He wanted to be a wrestler. And Vince McMahon Sr. would go, I don't know. He tried, he'd, he'd even come over and he'd say, you know, he's a nice boy, but get, he, he shouldn't be back here and all this. And I know Vince Jr. used him for a couple of things over at ringside with some broadcasting or something. So one night, uh, Andy knew me from the magazines. He was a big fan of the magazines. He asked me, what am I doing after the matches? And here he was as one of the main stars uh, on ABC TV show Taxi. So everybody knew who he was. So um, he said, what are you doing after the matches? I said, I'm going home. He said, where do you live? I said, Kew Gardens area. He said, how do you get home? I said, I take the E train or the F train to Union Turnpike and walk from there. So he said, can I go with you? So I said, sure. So now at 11.15 at night, I'm going down to Penn Station with Andy Kaufman. We're on the subway and people are looking like, is that, is that, is that? So we get up to my apartment and I was living with uh, Susan Sexton, a, uh, an Australian girl wrestler who's still one of my best friends. And uh, we walk in and she goes, 
every other word out of her mouth was the F-bomb. Oh, it's F and Andy Kaufman. <laughs> so we sat there for hours talking about wrestling. And finally, she had had enough. She says, I can't stand to talk about this anymore. Uh, I'm going in the, in the bedroom. She went in, put on her headphones and Ramones, gabba gabba hey, I want to, you know, teenage lobotomy and the whole bit. And um, that's for you people who know who the Ramones are, of course. If not, find the teen, look up teenage lobotomy on, uh, on YouTube. And so I was sitting with Andy and I said, you know, McMahon's not going to let you wrestle. But I have a friend in Memphis. His name is Jerry Lawler. And he says, oh, yeah, I've seen him in the magazine. And they, they, wait, they, they, they have a Frankenstein monster. He probably loved this. So it's one in the morning. He said, well, can we call him tomorrow? I said, it's, he's probably, it's 12 o'clock there. It's midnight in Memphis. Why don't we just call him right now? So we called Lawler. And Lawler said, Lawler said you have Andy Kaufman, the guy from Taxi, in your little roach-infested apartment in Queens? I said, yeah, hang on. He put him on. Uh, I put him on with uh, Jerry Lawler, and that put the key in the ignition, and that started that entire feud. And I was at the Letterman show uh, taking pictures along with Craig Peters there, and we never knew that whole thing was going to uh, happen. Uh, we never knew this thing was going to be that big, and uh, that turned out to be the first real major celebrity involvement in professional wrestling, and I was part of it, and I'm so thrilled to have made that phone call that night. Had we not done that, he may have found his way down to Jerry Lawler eventually, but it just wouldn't have been the same. Now, I, in the magazines, Mr. Weston said to me, we're not putting any comedian in the magazines. You want to do a page or two on your column, that's fine. So it, it, it's amazing, but that even today, that's a, uh, uh, it, they, it has a cult audience. Because people want to know, is Andy still alive? And is he going to cha challenge Jerry Lawler eventually again? <laughs> well, there was a whole, uh, I think it was Comedy Central, uh, did a whole hour-long special uh, many years ago on the whole lawler cough They did. Feud. They did. Yeah. yeah, they did. Now, remember, I'm an original New Yorker, so it's Kaufman. Kaufman, that's right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a, hey, I'm, I'm an original New Yorker, too, and I, 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 I say it a completely different way. I know it. Uh, one of my favorite stories from your book, yeah, and there's so many of them, but we'll, we'll share one or two here, uh, is what I call Taz, the supermarket stalker. Yeah, uh, you, yeah. you, now, you played a role in helping him get noticed and get his first big break, but at first, Absolutely. you weren't quite sure who this person was that was following you around. <laughs> no, there was this little guy following me around uh, in the supermarket. Uh, uh, almost every night and finally I turned around to him it's like one o'clock in the morning when I shopped can I help you he says yo you Bill Apta he says I'm a big mark for you he told me that his father worked for a uh, vending machine company uh, and because uh, he first asked me if I had any kids oh yeah I have two little kids well I get sodas I get candy for free so I invited him down to my uh, my condo in Massapequa Park Long Island Cameo Townhouses, 16 Townhouse Drive. And uh, uh, so he started coming by every every few nights. We became really good friends. And then he brought this guy named Tommy down, and it turned out to be Tommy Dreamer. So, uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. Randy Savage is one of my all-time favorites. Uh, I think he would yeah. be probably on a lot of people's lists as one of their favorites. And, and you had a good relationship with him except for – uh, that one time that Eric Bischoff told you that Savage wanted to murder you, why yes. did Randy Savage want to kill Bill After? Well, I don't want, I, I hate to leave this as a cliffhanger, but I promised the book company and the audio book company that I wouldn't go into detail on that. You have to read about that. And it is worthwhile, I will tell people. Uh, it is a, a worthwhile, funny story, and, and thankfully he did not. Funny? Wait a minute. Well, Wait, he, was funny. No, he, was, he was nose to nose <laughs> with me. You son of a so-and-so. <laughs> Why did you write that? I, well, I, should, I should kill you for that, you son of a being. Funny in hindsight. Funny in hindsight. And, no, not to me. Not to me. Luckily, years before he died, and thanks to Hulk Hogan, uh, everything was smoothed over. But it was probably the most frightening uh, time I ever spent anywhere. Hmm. It was that scary. Well, he could be a very intense guy. Oh, yeah, he could be. And yet uh, uh, I was friends with him for years before that. And I talked to Lanny Poffo all the time. And Lanny explained to me why he 
he got so hostile. You got to know Vince Sr. fairly well through your uh, interactions well. with him. And well. uh, you've yeah. gotten to know his son as well. How would you compare the two business-wise and personality-wise? Very difficult to do. Vince, uh, both of them, uh, Vince Sr. was a very dapper looking man, uh, very personable. Um, he, he looked like... Uh, uh, he, he, he looked like he could star in a movie. He always had a tuxedo on. He, he was terrific. In terms of his personality, he was, uh, he was, he was business. He was, he was all business. Uh, I used to speak with him probably once a week on the telephone. Uh, his wife would answer the phone. He'd give me a little bit of information. Uh, Vince Jr., terrific to me from the, uh, from the beginning when he started planning his uh, nationwide expansion, he offered me the job as editor of his first magazine, and I turned it down because um, I was very loyal to Stanley Weston. I'm loyal to whoever I work for. But through the years, I've had uh, great times with him. I've had run-ins with him, uh, but he has always uh, told people that he respects me and respects what I do and did, and there's there's no he totally two different people than he and his dad. There are several things that he did uh, business wise that his dad probably wouldn't have because of his relationship with his old cronies. But Vince Jr. saw this product and said that you know I can make this uh, a national phenomenon and a worldwide phenomenon, and uh, took him a while, but look where we are today. I think one of the examples of, of, I think, the respect that Vince has for you, and you talk about this in your book, and I didn't know this, uh, was that Vince was already thinking about a physical WWE Hall of Fame back in, yeah. in 1993 when he first formed it. And for a time, he hired you to start collecting items for it. How did, Absolutely. How did that come about, and, and what ended up happening with that project? Well, he called me um, to ask. Uh, I had... Uh, uh, the company, London Publishing, was sold to another publisher in Pennsylvania, and my wife and I were ready to move. Uh, we were packing up everything. The house had been sold, and I got a call from Vince's secretary saying that he needs to talk to me, and he asked me, Did, have I moved yet? And I said, no, why? He said, can you come up here tomorrow? And I went there, and I sat in a meeting with uh, Linda, Vince, and uh, uh, J.J. Dillon, who kind of brokered this deal, and it was to be that we would like to hire you to uh, um, be the uh, curator of our Hall of Fame and to procure stuff from the legends and things like that. And uh, I said, okay, that may take me a few months. What happens after that? And they hadn't come up with a plan yet. So thinking about my family, my instinct was not to do that. So we broke uh, for about an hour and a half, two hours for lunch. We all went our separate ways. And when I came back, they offered me a position uh, weekly, uh, weekly, weekly payoff, as they would say, uh, for two years to procure um, memorabilia for the eventual Hall of Fame. And after two years, uh, we decided not to continue. But yeah, it was great. It was the first checks I ever got from the WWE. Hmm. And what were some of the items that you were able to round up? Buddy Rogers boots. Uh, something from Eddie Gilbert, um, uh, some trunks from some of the wrestlers. I don't remember. It was such a long time ago. But Buddy Rogers' boots was the premier thing. Okay. So when WWE, uh, let's let's say they open their Hall of Fame in the next uh, few years, I'm going to be looking for that. Yeah, yeah, you definitely should be. And hopefully they'll call me back and ask me to be part of the uh, uh, part of the whole thing. Yeah, you should be there to be part of the ribbon cutting. Uh, yes, you're right. <laughs> you're right. You're right. With with an elbow drop. There you go. Well, actually, your your uh, big move is the figure four. That's what I. It think. is. I can put the figure four on, and I do this at conventions. See, I now do a one man show based on my book, and uh, uh, I sing, I do comedy, I tell wrestling stories. We have contests. The best contest since you brought him up is I have a Taz singlet, and I have two people come up on stage. And how long does it take for a non wrestling human being to get into a Taz singlet? <laughs> And it's really great. And I have prizes that I give out and stuff. So, uh, yeah, uh, that, that's, uh, uh, that's something fans should look for as well. When my one-man show, I call it a showmanar. 
It's his wrestling fix, an afternoon or an evening with Bill Apter. And if anybody would like to book me for that, uh, be Apter at OneWrestling.com or hit me up on uh, Twitter or uh, Facebook and always willing to listen. Now, we need to talk about Mania Crawl. Sure. Well, we're going to get to that later. Yeah, we're gonna okay. we're gonna save that for the end. We'll save the best for last. Oh, I, I you sounded like you were wrapping up. No, 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 okay. no, 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 okay. not yet. I was actually gonna ask uh, next about. We're Muhammad. here all night, folks. <laughs> yeah, we are. I was gonna actually ask you next about Muhammad Ali. Uh, he yeah. recently passed away. Uh, you did a great write up on WWE.com about meeting him for the first time. What was it like being around Ali? Uh, there was no one more charismatic in the universe than Muhammad Ali. And I don't mean the WWE universe. I mean the whole universe. Uh, he could be moody. When he was training for the uh, second Leon Sphinx fight, and I approached him uh, just to do some shtick with him and all that, he was quiet. But most of the time around him, he was on and he was delightful. But he was also a very introspective human being. And you could see sometimes when the press left and I was there a little bit longer because I was good friends with Angelo Dundee, his, uh, his trainer, that he wasn't on all the time. But he, he was, uh, I, I shot a lot of his fights. I photographed a lot of his fights and got to talk to him many, many times. And he knew me because he was a wrestling fan too. Well, I mean, similar to Andy Kaufman. See, I said it right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I, I love reading about like these old celebrities who uh, turn out to be these huge wrestling fans. Well, he didn't. You know, when I first met him, I he kept staring at me. He was he was at a press conference uh, about his fight against Jimmy Jimmy Ellis, and he kept looking through all the photographers. That guy, that little guy over there. I'm gonna whoop Jimmy Ellis. Then I'm gonna wrestle, and I'm gonna whoop you. So he never told me, really, he knew me from the magazines, but I, at that point, I knew it right away. And Tyson, too. Mike Tyson was another one who was a big wrestler. Oh, yes. Mike Tyson was just another story <laughs> completely. You have any people I can beat up? Yeah, Mike Mike, uh, Mike was a huge Dusty Rhodes fan. Did, does a pretty good uh, Dusty imitation. Yeah, when I was posing him, we uh, to get him in the mood, you know, we were doing wrestling imitations. So uh, I never knew that he was going to turn out to be who he was. I lent him 15 cents to get on the subway uh, that he never paid me back, by the way. Hmm. You mentioned Dusty. We also lost the American Dream uh, last year, uh, actually not too long before your book was published. You knew yeah. Dusty. I know you also do a mean Dusty Rhodes impression. Uh, what are some of your favorite memories of the dream? Well, Dusty was, when you talk about Muhammad Ali, right up in the same level was Dusty Rhodes. Uh, he was a bundle, a ball of charisma when he was in front of people. However, when he was off camera, he was a creator. He was all business. And he loved the business so much that he, even if someone didn't ask to be mentored, he would go over and offer his uh uh, his word on what they looked like in the ring or how they could improve themselves, even if they didn't ask. He was, uh, he was, he was terrific. But again, he, he was all business when he was off, uh, off stage, so to say. He was a very devoted family man. Uh, I was just with his wife, uh, Michelle, uh, and his daughter in, um, uh, in Charlotte at the Fan Fest, and it was wonderful to see them again. Can you give us a, a little bit of the dream? You see the Salamantha monster, if you will. All my little black babies, white babies, Chinese babies, booging down to the internet, if you will, to listen to the Salamantha. <laughs> There's a little Dusty Rose for you. That's awesome. Let me ask you this. So for, for as long as you've been around the business and, and you know, you've ended up <clears throat> on the physical end of some matches, usually when, oh, you, yeah. usually when you weren't expecting it, did, did you ever think about becoming a manager? Is that something that ever crossed your mind? Yeah, many, many, many times I thought about it. But then because I was working, I had seen a lot of other magazine editors when some of the other lower lining magazines doing that. And I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be that. I wanted to keep up my professional look. And if I did that, I did it once or twice at some small promotions, but if I did that, that would have 
uh, compromised who I am in the wrestling business. Oh, Bill just wants to be out there and be another one of these guys. No, I had a very good role uh, in the wrestling business where I went from like a Jimmy Olsen character to a, uh, uh, to a Perry White type of character. And uh, I, uh, it, it's amazing that I can say after all these years that that's the role that they that all these promotions, Jim Crockett Promotions, Georgia Championship Wrestling, uh, all of them uh, down in Texas, uh, Florida, everywhere, they made me the reporter guy. I was the journalist that came down to cover them. So that was the persona that they enhanced of me on their shows, and I didn't want to get away from that. Now, I didn't realize this until I read your book, how big a fan you are of karaoke. And I definitely would not have... Well, I I definitely... It's more than a fan. My best friend, Paul Big Bear, he's 6'8", 385 pounds. He's a former wrestler, wrestled as the Concrete Cowboy. Uh, He and I do... um, uh, He and I do shows at senior homes where we use karaoke backgrounds so it's not actually karaoke because I don't sing anything that I don't know the words for. Back in my early mid twenties, I entertained in the Catskill Mountains with several singing groups. Uh, we sang with a live band and sometimes with uh, recorded stuff. So I've been an entertainer my whole life. In my one man shows, the first one that I did was just a Q and A, and I came home and I said to my wife, it "Doesn't feel right. I need to sing and put on a whole show." and do something different than any other one-man show. So do I still go out and sing at karaoke? Absolutely, I love it. I, you give me a microphone, and I, in my wallet at all times, I have a flash drive with about 60 songs that I do. <laughs> so just plug it into your computer, into your speaker, and I'm there. No, I love to sing. Well, Always did. Well, well, one of the cool things that I didn't know is, and I would never have guessed, that the person who introduced you to it or, or took you to your first karaoke club in Japan was Haku. Yes, yeah, yeah, he did. When I was in Japan, he told me, and you have to sit, sit down, a karaoke had just come out, you had to sit down at the bar and, you know, just be very respectful, read the words and sing the song. So that gave me license uh, to get up on the bar and perform. So when I did that at many clubs in Japan, and again, in the book, there's some funny stories about uh, uh, karaoke and a... uh, uh, and a big, very important jokey. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, but I still do this once or twice a week here in Pennsylvania. Uh, and on uh, on uh, the night before SummerSlam, uh, me and some of the uh, uh, people who write for OneWrestling.com are going to go to Karaoke Duet uh, off 8th Avenue and 53rd Street in um in Manhattan, like 10, 30, 11 o'clock that night after NXT. And uh, we're going to hang out for a few hours. So, yeah, I, whenever I can get the opportunity to see, I also rap. Do you know that? I do not, no. Okay, so uh, go to YouTube after we're all done with this, everybody, and put in uh, Bill After Raps Moon River. I take uh, old songs from the 60s, and I, I do uh, even Barry Manilow songs. And I do like Yo Moon River, wider than a mile. I'm crossing you in style someday. You dream maker, you heartbreak. And I can, you know, <laughs> Barry Manilow songs. Her name was Lola. She was a showgirl at the Copa. Copa. Yeah, I love doing that wow. stuff. I did that. The reason I came up with that is when Paul and I do some of the senior homes, the nurses are falling asleep. So I said, yo, nurse, this is for you. And I'll take an old Andy Williams standard like Moon River and start rapping that. And I'll say, do more of that. Now, Bill's going to be joining us for our SummerSlam meetup this Sunday in Brooklyn at the KBH Beer Hall at 2 p.m. We're partnering with Mania Crawl. Should be a fun time. Uh, You will be there selling and signing copies of your book. Is that right? I will, but if someone already has the book, you can bring it, and I'd be glad to sign it. And whatever we charge, a portion of that goes to Connor's Cure. Uh, Same thing, I will have uh, my books. I'll have collectible is wrestling fixed? I didn't know it was broken. Baseball caps for sale as well. And a portion of that will go to Connor's Cure. Uh, but mainly we want people to come out, have a good time. Uh, I hear on good word that one of the former editors of Pro Wrestling Illustrated, who people don't believe existed, Gary Morgenstein, lives in that area. And he may come to uh, uh, to see us all that day as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, uh, and and you never know, Bill may end up uh, singing some karaoke. You never well, know. Well, if they've got, if they, did they have a microphone and a sound system there? I have no idea. <laughs> See, I never say I do karaoke. I just say I sing. I use karaoke tracks, but I don't really do karaoke. Well, you never know when, when, when Bill may bust out into song at one of yes. these events. Yes, yes. Yes, so we need to find out if they have, and, uh, and what I suggested as well is come with your best wrestling imitation. So if they have a microphone there, let's do a let's do fifteen twenty minutes of uh, of wrestling imitations, and I'll bring some prizes. Sure, you get some alcohol in people. You never know what they may say. Yeah, well, my drink, by the way, and if anyone's listening and wants to bring me a drink, my drink is called Sparkling Ice. You can get it at any. Uh, uh, any supermarket, orange mango is my favorite, followed by peach and then lemon and lime. Hmm. So if this is a BYOB. Can be. Yeah, for that kind of stuff. That's right. <laughs> but I, I'm still, I haven't done a signing in Brooklyn yet, so I'm hoping we have a really, really great crowd. And yeah. I'm looking forward to meeting you in person. Well, you know, you and I met once. I don't think you would remember, but we did meet at Wrestle Reunion 7 in Miami. That was you? That was, that was me, yes. Well, I got it. Well, you see, one of the things I was so excited about there, I knew Bobby Heenan was going to be there, and Bobby is, is my all-time favorite. So yeah, I said, I have, to, I have to go to this thing. I want to at least meet Bobby. And I was wearing a, a shirt uh, that said, that's not fair to Flair. So when I approached him, he immediately, he pointed at the shirt, looked at his wife, and just kept pointing at the shirt like he loved the shirt. So that made my day. But then uh, right after I met him, I was walking, and along came uh, a gentleman by the name of Bill Apter, and I got a photo, and <laughs> it was very, uh, very you gotta nice. you got to send me a copy of that photo. I'd like to well, see I'll it. show you as soon as we're done here. Before we leave each other, I have a question to ask you. Sure. Um, is wrestling fixed? I didn't know it was broken. Darn. You are a, a national treasure. And uh, tell people how they can find you online. Well, um, Twitter uh, at Apter One Wrestling, with the number one, not the word. And there's no N in Apter. Dusty Rhodes for years would call me Willie Apna. And people used to send me mail, physical mail to the magazines, Dear Bill Apner. There's no N in it. It's Apter One Wrestling. And I'm on Facebook. Uh, or you can email me at beaptor at onewrestling.com. Again, it's the number one, not the word. And please follow me. Go to onewrestling.com and uh, onewrestlingvideo.com as well. That's where all our videos are housed. Yep. Bill's, Bill is always doing a ton of interviews, and he has a lot of fun features up there, so I would uh, recommend that everybody check that out. Bill, thanks for taking the time to do this. You're welcome back anytime. All right. Well, uh, I'll, t I'll talk to you in an hour then. Well, thank you, uh, everybody, for listening. Check out the full Sound Off shows every Sunday. I am the Solid Monster. He is Bill Apter, and we will see you at the matches. Sounds good. <laughs>